Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jamie Connorman Cease. I am a clinical ethics assistant professor here at the Center for Bioethics at the University of Minnesota. Um, thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, Unpacking Bedside Bioethics is a quarterly lecture series focused on a range of bioethics topics that impact clinical care and clinical work, which is why we call it Bedside Bioethics. So today, our, fo our focus is going to be on adolescent decision making. And before I introduce our speaker and get into our topic, I want to discuss a couple of housekeeping issues. So... If you are part of the M Health Fairview system, the Center for Bioethics provides ethics consultation. You can contact us 24 seven through our secure messaging platform, Vocera, with the clinical ethics consultation service. Um, this is a service that we provide for inpatients, um, inpatient consultation only. So um, for our session today, we ask that you use the Q&A function to follow up on any questions that you might have um, or ask those questions. If you're having technical difficulties, please use the chat function. Um, we don't have the ability to respond to the raise hand function, so please don't use this function in the webinar today. We are recording this session. Uh, this session, as well as past Unpacking Bedside Bioethics sessions, are available on our website in the events tab. Um, we have captioning enabled, so please enable captions if that's something you would benefit from. Um, we really do appreciate your feedback in these sessions, so we um, will send you an evaluation after the session is over. There's three ways you can get that evaluation. It will pop up. Um, it will be linked in our presentations details document, which is in the chat, um, and you will receive an email after this event. Like I said, this um, evaluation really does help us shape the future of this series. If you are seeking credit, we offer two types of credit for this event. First, if you would like a certificate of attendance for CEUs, please follow the link in the presentation details. We can offer about a certificate of attendance for you. Second, if you are a University of Minnesota health professional student, we offer interprofessional education credit for you. It requires that you participate in a 15 minute post event group discussion and complete a reflection form. Both of those are in the presentations details document. This is for University of Minnesota students only. Um, also, if you are um, in our, I don't know what that class is actually, but we do receive uh, offer credit for particular students in this class listed on the, on the, on the slide here. Um, so please follow that. All right, with follow-up questions, please answer, uh, find us at our email. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ian Wolf. He is the Director of Ethics at Children's Minnesota. He earned his PhD in nursing and a master's in bioethics from the University of Minnesota. His research and writing focuses on the ethical dilemmas that arise in the pediatric setting. Ian will also be presenting at the Center for Bioethics Ethics Grand Round series in April on pediatric gender care. And if you're interested in attending that webinar, please register on our website. So if you would like more information on our speaker, Ian Wolf, today, please check out that presentation details. It has a more thorough introduction and some really great links to, to connect with him further. So now I'll turn it over to you, Ian. Thank you so much for presenting on adolescent decision making with us today. All right, thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, so the title of the talk is gonna be the angst and adolescent decision-making and, and um, I've already been introduced here. So I'm gonna move on to that next slide. Hopefully. Um, so I, I like to think more in practical terms. And, and so when thinking about my objectives, I, I like to map them out and, and things that make sense practically. And so the roadmap I'm gonna to follow today is we're gonna, I want to illustrate like what is the big deal of adolescent decision making? Why is there so much angst around adolescent decision making? Um, uh, so why and then why is it a big deal? You know what are the tensions that cause so much angst about it, and and what do we do about it? So provide a framework for navigating these tensions in practice, as this is a practical focused uh, talk. And so to to give you an illustration of uh, you know what is the big deal, um, I want to provide a case of this to help us navigate through this. So uh, this is the publicized case of Cassandra Callender, who is several news reports and, and the uh, citation, citations below uh, colleagues of mine have written about. 
Um, Cassandra was diagnosed at 17 with Hodgkin's lymphoma, which uh, was believed to have an 80% uh, chance of cure. Um, and after undergoing several cycles of chemo, she refused further treatment. Uh, her mother supported this, and, and in fact, she had at one point run, ran away. Um, the uh, case was escalated to the state Supreme Court, um, which also met to consider whether she met standards for mature minor status. Uh, but they unfortunately said, or depending on how you think, fortunately said that she did not uh, meet the standards for mature minor and thus could not legally refuse. She was then held in the hospital for five months. Um, she Once she turned 18, her cancer returned and she initially refused treatment, but then acquiesced to standard treatment. Unfortunately, despite all that, she died at the age of 22. And so we're gonna put a poll up um, and I kind of wanna see what you think. Um, should Cassandra's request to forego treatment at 17 years old have been honored? So should she have been allowed to forego treatment? Let me give it another minute. It looks like we've got about 80% of folks and, and we're 49% yes, 36%, 37% unsure. And I'll go on a little bit. That looks like half the group says yes, but a significant majority are unsure. Um, and this gets us into sort of what is the big deal? Um, well, in her case, refusal could lead to death where potential cure rate was favorable, 80% cure rate, right? Um, overriding her refusal obligates clinicians to do things to her over her descent, where at the time, six more months when she turned 18, she could have refused. Uh, but then uh, she would be alive to make the choice, uh, which while she initially refused treatment, she later acquiesced to. So, um, you know, one could say, well, she was alive at 18 to make that choice and she did acquiesce to it. So maybe that speaks to the fact we should have forced her and did force her. Um, but unfortunately, she did die despite the treatment. So was overriding her refusal worth it? Or did we put her through unnecessary trauma, uh, even though she died? And so to, to talk about adolescent decision-making, the angst, um, I think we first need to talk, and I do this a lot with all my talks, is starting with the, how do we consider the ethics of medical interventions? Um, and the reason I, I do this is because I want to try to give you a sense of the pieces that make up the puzzle of decision-making, right? So pointing out all the pieces that go into how we look at decision-making for um, pediatrics, but then adolescents specifically. Um, and so we'll go through these today. And I am aware that sometimes I might end up looking like this at the end of the talk. Hopefully it makes more sense than um, Charlie's billboard here, but uh, you can be the judge of that. And so when we think about ethical considerations of medical interventions, we have to think about what is the value of medical interventions, right? So we have all these things that we do um, for good reason that have uh, that lead to people surviving um, and returning to their natural state of health. Um, but it's important to remember that medical interventions are neither good nor bad in and of themselves, meaning medical interventions, IVs, breathing tubes, uh, chemotherapy, all these things are not don't have any inherent value, right? So they only have value based on the amount of benefit they might provide in proportion to the amount of burden required for their implementation. Right? So this is a proportional benefit. And this gets into the idea of proportionality, right? So when we look at medical interventions, we look at the proportion of benefit to burden that they bring. And this gets us into considerations of beneficence and non-maleficence. We want to do good and not do harm. Um, and proportionality is actually a pretty old concept, at least uh, in my reading, I've saw it go back to 16th century Catholic theology, um, where they talk about when somebody might be obligated to pursue medical interventions. Uh, even in the 16th century, uh, it was talked about in, in considerations of what is proportionate versus disproportionate, meaning so what is proportionate uh, benefit to burden and what is disproportionate benefit to burden. And also in terms of ordinary treatment versus extraordinary treatments as well. Um, so those had different considerations, but 
in pediatric decision making, the proportion of, of benefits a burden does a lot of work, but doesn't do all the work. We also bring in to play the idea of certainty and treatment effectiveness. Uh, and this can be uh, talked about in many different ways, one being prognostic uncertainty uh, or prognostic certainty. Um, how, how much do we have? Uh, I always like to tell people it doesn't have to be absolute certainty. And in fact, it, it's argued that we probably can never have absolute certainty, um, but it must be reasonable certainty. Um, and this can be the certainty of uh, so pro prognostication. So uh, the certainty that we will uh, you know, achieve an outcome that is within, uh, within, within reason. Uh, also, the certainty of attaining a proportionate benefit burden balance. Uh, the other consideration that comes in here is treatment effectiveness. So uh, one would say with Cassandra, I think most people would say that that 80% cure rate was sort of treatment effectiveness, right? So um, it, it was treatment effectiveness was it was 80%. Uh, but it's not always about cure. Um, treatment effectiveness can be defined uh, in many different ways. Um, and so one might be, say, the likelihood of liberation from life-sustaining treatments. Uh, so often in, in ultra-short gut, we talk about um, you know, enter autonomy, the ability to come off TPN. Uh, it can also be survival, uh, et cetera. And in general, we look at uh, things in terms of, you know, what is might be the best interest standard where things are an optimal decision, uh, balanced out by the lower threshold of harm, where it would be a harmful decision, and in the middle, having that sort of zone of parental discretion that widens with our prognostic uncertainty. So the, the more uncertain we are, the more we want to incorporate values in uh, how one might uh, weigh value into risk uh, of, of that or certainty around that, that outcome. And these three things all go together, um, which in some ways have been talked about as sort of mandatory, uh, an optional um, or a um, or impermissible, but and I find this framework a little bit more interesting, which is, uh, so treatment effectiveness, certainty, and proportionality all work together to lead us to where things might be uh, in terms of whether they're impermissible, permissible, or obligatory. Um, and this is uh, from the citation below, Mercurio, um, the IPO framework, right? And so looking at treatment effectiveness, uh, certainty and proportionality can give us a sense of where these things might lay uh, in this sort of framework of, are they impermissible, meaning uh, that's not something we can do? Are they obligatory, meaning that's something you can't refuse? Or are they in the middle where it might be permissible, even if inadvisable, or permissible, even if advisable? So in Cassandra's case, we're looking at, you know, is it permissible to refuse, uh, even if it's advisable, right? Or is it obligatory? Um, and this really helps us uh, delineate out where that, that sort of zone of ethical permissibility is uh, in pediatrics. And so some examples of this are things that are impermissible would, would be where there's no benefits to the patient with reasonable certainty and also a high risk and or burden. So surgery with no medical indication, um, ECMO with no potential to come off, although that is becoming a little bit debatable lately, uh, and futile treatments. So treatments that have no ability to achieve a physiologic uh, goal or, or a uh, projected goal. Um, things that are permissible might be where the risks and or burden are high, benefits are uncertain or subjective, meaning they're, where they're within that sort of gray zone or that zone of parental discretion where we really wanna look for uh, how someone values uh, benefits and burden balances or risks in that way, right? And so these are things like transplant where you're trading one chronic condition for another, um, single ventricle repair, uh, experimental treatment, life-sustaining treatment in the presence of quality of life considerations. So treatments where reasonable people might disagree over the benefit burden balance of so the idea of proportionality and might take, might take different approaches to uh, uncertainty around achieving uh, a particular outcome. And then there's things that are obligatory, such as where the proportional, uh, there's proportional benefits to burden, the benefits have a high degree of certainty, treatment effectiveness is high. Right, so so low burden, high benefits. Um, so things like insulin, right? Um, you know, we we don't allow for parental value judgments around giving a, a type one diabetic child insulin. We would say that uh, the child has a right to insulin, even though it's not curative, right? So 
its treatment effectiveness isn't based on cure because we're not curing diabetes, uh, but it's effective in keeping the child alive, right? And so the, the, the certainty of that effectiveness is high. Uh, it's a low burden, arguably uh, um, high benefit. Um, other things such as are such as like IV antibiotics for bacterial meningitis, or say surgery for pyloric stenosis. And and that's a little bit more of a granular view on what we in day to day in pediatrics think of as our sort of guiding principle and our limiting principle. So the best interest standard being one of guiding, right? We we hear the word best interest. What are the best interests uh, thrown around a lot in practice? Um, but often there's disagreements about what is best, which is why I like the earlier graphic of where it says suboptimal or, or sorry, optimal, uh, because sometimes we're just looking for optimal, not necessarily best, uh, absolute best, because um, this can be subjective and disagreements often happen around exactly how to define best. Um, and the harm principle is limiting in that, you know, we look for, uh, you're limited at the point of significant imminent harm through action or inaction. Uh, and this needs to be objective, right? The burden of proof then is on clinicians to, to prove that. Um, and this then way goes into the state's interest under parents patry of protecting vulnerable citizens um, and then thus clinicians obligations to mandatory reporting but this also you need to consider the harms from demanding or refusing the treatment versus the harms from overriding authority right so um, you know it's not just the demands from um, saying no to the treatment or demanding it but what are the harms of overriding authority um, and we want parental and patient authority to some degree because we want to respect autonomy. And we also want to provide fair process uh, in determining where we might think that lay, it lays, that decision lays in the threshold. Um, adolescence makes this a little more complicated, right? And so why is it such a big deal in adolescence? Well, all of us have at one time on this talk today been an adolescent, and we can often look back at our from our current view as adults um, and see those areas where, man, we did not make a good decision. <laughs> and, and so uh, we look at adolescents making decisions around medical interventions as quite uncomfortable. Um, we remember our decisions based on our view of who we are today as adults and the decisions we might have made as an adolescent. And I think a good majority, I'm guessing, would would have find something in their adolescence where they they wish they wouldn't have made that decision um, or questioned their ability at that time to make that decision. Um, but we're also more limited in overriding or influencing adolescence too, right? Our toddlers, we can distract, uh, we can bribe with with stickers and and treats. Um, adolescents become more difficult, um, and they can be more involved. But what if they make bad choices. And the reason we have this, this concern or this angst is we, we have this obligation to protect uh, their right to an open future. Um, and so, you know, children have rights and trust. I mean, they have anticipatory autonomy rights. Um, we protect future autonomy sometimes by limiting free choice now, um, which is why we institute bedtimes, which is why we make their meals and don't let uh, kids get to choose, um, and because we're protecting their sort of future autonomy, we're given this these rights. We're protecting their their rights and trust uh, for their future self, and the child's future self cannot necessarily be established by presence, desires, or preferences. So, um, you know, especially under the age of ten, um, we we can't uh, we we can't establish their future self based on what they're currently acting like uh, or what they're currently expressing. Though in some cases, uh, for children with terminal conditions, we might hold more weight um, in the, to their considerations at this time. And the way we protect open future can involve limiting parental authority, right, for, for non-adolescents or even sometimes adolescents um, through, say, the harm principle. Um, it often involves limiting free choice of the child, so limits to their request for and refusal of medical interventions. Uh, teenagers are allowed to make more free choice, um, and it can also involve a not ideal care plan, right? And so some of the angst around adolescent decision-making comes up when they say we have a teenager requesting treatment, a teenager refusing treatment, or even maybe poorly managing treatment. And this gets us into adolescents as decision-makers, uh, probably showing my age by that picture. Um, if you haven't seen Heather's uh, great classic movie, um, 
empirical evidence suggests that most adolescents over the age of 13 possess capacity to make reasonable decisions regarding medical treatment. And many adolescents older than 14 appear capable of making rational decisions and fulfilling the requirements of informed consent. However, in practice, these abilities do not always seem to be exercised optimally, right? So there's peer influence. Uh, adolescents seem to be less future oriented. They're more impulsive um, and they have a differing assessment of risk and reward. And that gets into how we consider the adolescent brain in the context of making decisions, right? And so around puberty, there's maturation of the social emotional control. Um, but then the cognitive control part of the brain doesn't mature until the mid to late 20s and integration between the two matures in the late 20s, right? So we have this the window of opportunity and time, this, this, this early adolescence, this time of rapid learning and brain development uh, increases in sensation seeking, motivation for social relations and sensitivity to social evaluation. Um, they also have this really important time of, rem of structural remodeling and reconfiguration of the brain system. So a crucial time where learning and brain development are happening. And adolescent brains are sensitive to stressors, right? Biological, uh, population-based, and social stressors, right? And uh, what's not more of a stressor than a, an illness, right? And so when we're in the, the context of the hospital or the clinic setting, or any healthcare, uh, there is inevitable stress that's going to come up here. And overall, we we want to include uh, kids in decision making um, independently because it helps. Again, that's that time of remodeling and learning. It helps them build the skills we want them to build to become a future adult, which is self confidence, decisiveness, thoughtfulness, analytical thinking, empathy trust in oneself. Um, but we also have this consideration that, you know, assent to things does not equal consent, right? Children cannot legally consent if we're defining consent as a legal term uh, in that they are the ones who uh, can sign their name to acquiesce to the, uh, the question at hand. Children are capable of participating in decision making related to their care. And we want assent because it protects a child's rights. Um, so even though it's not the same as what we'd consider consent, um, a sense helps protect their rights uh, in these decisions. It respects them as a moral agent, particularly as they become adolescents, when we want them to take more ownership and more control as a moral agent. Um, it respects a child's developing capacity, even if they're unable to make autonomous choices. So as children age, and this will be different for every children, which makes this so complicated, um, their developing capacity is something we want to empower um, because it not only helps give them a voice into their care, um, but also helps develop those skills they'll need as an adult. You know, and it empowers them to the extent of their capacity. We want to honor the adolescent's assent for the positive aspects while constraining their ability to legally consent in order to protect their open future. And so this is why this is so such a difficult space because you're trying to balance both of those worlds. And you're doing this on top of the fact that they do not have a fully developed prefrontal cortex, uh, the prefrontal cortex being associated with high level reasoning, executive functioning, rational decision making, and emotional regulation. And it, uh, Doug Dikema in his paper um, that I use a lot for this talk uh, talks about this as a prefrontal cortex deficit disorder, meaning you know that adolescents have an impulsiveness, an inflexibility, an aggressiveness, recklessness, uh, emotional volatility, uh, they have risk-taking for short-term reward, vulnerability to peer pressure, and a tendency to underestimate long-term consequences and to overlook alternatives. And we're doing this, uh, th this all exists in a time where we want them to have to develop that burgeoning autonomy. So as children near the age of majority, we recognize a growing desire and need to include them in decisions regarding their health, uh, they have a growing capacity, we would say, right? But this will vary by decision, by age, developmental and maturity level. And so there isn't a one size fits all uh, age for this, right? There's a sort of historic rule of sevens um, where uh, there's a sort of presumption of incapacity under seven. 
Um, there is a sort of in between area. And then at 14, we presume capacity that can be rebutted if they do not have it. So there's a general sense that we, we consider around 14 when they start having capacity. But of course, it all, it all depends on uh, the, the individual and what the decision is itself. Um, they also, one of the reasons we want to include adolescents more in their care is that they have a developing bodily autonomy, right? And, and this is uh, significantly true for, for adults, right? And as they get towards that age of majority, we want them to be able to exercise their liberty uh, more. Um, autonomy being based on the liberty as a negative right, meaning the right to be free from interference. Um, it's not a positive right, so it's not a right to demand or receive. And as children age, it becomes more important to allow them to be in control of their, what I call bodily integrity, right? To, to realize their right to refuse even beneficial interventions. Um, and make it, I wanna make a distinction here that capacity and competency, I, I consider two separate concepts just because it makes it a little bit easier to comprehend. Um, it, it, you'll hear them interchange quite a bit, but I, I like to talk about capacity uh, in a decisional sense versus competency being being sort of a legal sense. And ca capacity is looking at more decisional capacity, the ability to understand and weigh risks and benefits and alternatives with reasonable consistency over time. Competency being sort of the ability to do something well. Um, again, we sort of presume capacity at 14, and I, I bold and underline that because that's a presumption that can be rebutted. Um, the, most uh, teens cannot legally consent but in general, their assent and dissent should be respected. And we're gonna go off in a little bit of a legal framework here for a minute. Um, so some state laws, so state laws set are ages for when the authority to legally consent is granted. So right in most states, that's 18, um, the magic number of 18, when you're able to then now legally do all these things. Um, there's also this con concept of mature minors uh, where we would consider their maturity level high enough to be able to make uh, a decision, so to assent and dissent or to even legally consent. Uh, there's different mechanisms by state. You really need to look into the mechanisms that exist within your state. Although many state laws, if not all, allow adolescents to consent for condition-specific things such as reproductive and sexual health treatment, mental health and substance abuse treatment, many of these things being public health issues. Um, in Minnesota, um, we have a minor consent for health care um, statutes. Um, they consider minor anyone under the age of 18. Um, circumstances around this are generally for emergency treatment. Uh, a minor who has been married or has given birth, a minor living apart from parents and managing their own financial affairs. It's not delineated out in the uh, Minnesota statutes, but in other states too, there's a consideration for a minor who is in the armed services as there's a small number of 17-year-olds um, of that can enlist for military service. And some of the healthcare services that uh, minors can consent for um, in Minnesota is abortion where minors' li life is at risk, so that would, that would fall under emergency care. Um, admission to a treatment facility for mental illness, this happens at the age of 16. Uh, chemical dependency or developmental disability, that is not well-defined uh, in the statute. Um, uh, adolescents at the age of 16 in Minnesota can donate organs. Uh, at 17, they can donate blood. Um, it does not say what age, but they can consent for hepatitis B vaccination, pregnancy and associated conditions, so they can get treatment for pregnancies and associated conditions, uh, they can legally consent to those. Uh, treatment for sexually transmitted infections, alcohol and drug abuse, non-residential mental health services. And to, to note here that consent is effective in good faith. Um, and the minor is financially responsible uh, and the professional judgment should be used regarding parental notification. This is right from the uh, Minnesota House research that looked at the statutes and gave sort of a summary of those things. And what that a, a consent effective in good faith means is that um, you, you take what they say in good faith um, based on their ability to uh, consent and what treatment they're consenting for and things like that. And so let's return to Cassandra. So at 17, uh, she's at the cusp of legal competency, right? So um, one of the things I read 
when she when she got forced to undergo treatment and, and stay at the hospital, she was six months shy of eighteen. So a few months seem somewhat arbitrary, right? And uh, there's harm from forced hospitalization and treatment, right? We we don't know um, how willingly she went along with that or how willingly she was going to go along with that. Uh, what what sort of things did we need to do to to ensure she underwent that treatment? Um, but on the other hand. Uh, she lived to adulthood where she sought treatment. So I think reasonable questions here are whether we caused undue harm to Cassandra and did we protect her open future? And so I want to go back again to a poll and think, see, what do you think? See if it's changed at all uh, under some of this information. Maybe not. Just gonna give it a minute here to see. So far we're seeing more yeses. So people have changed their mind to say, yes, we should have. Um, interesting, we have about 70%. So as that goes, Jamie will look at the, the scores, but at this point we're pretty significantly higher on yes, we, uh, um, should have Cassandra's request for go treatment at 17 been honored? Yes. Okay, so what do we do about this then? Um, we have a growing desire to include adolescents in decisions. We have also obligations to protect their open future. How do we reconcile all the tensions that exist in adolescent decision-making? How do we approach this angst in adolescent decision-making um, and I think, you know, as I said before, some of this angst is, is ours, although anybody with adolescence, which, of which I am one, knows the angst that comes with adolescence itself. Um, but but this, this angst I like to look at, this is really ours because we're trying to do two things. We're trying to respect their bodily integrity. We're trying to include them more in decisions. At the same time, we're still trying to limit them and protect their open future. So let's get back to the bedside then. What do we do about this, right? And we're mostly dealing here in angst around refusals, demands, or suboptimal management. And this gets into questions of how we balance burdens and benefits of treatment, current and future uncertainty, uh, how we protect adolescents from potentially bad decisions, but at the same time, respecting control over their bodies. Um, and really this gets into a, considerations of good process. So whenever there's competing interests, significant uncertainty, and competing ethical tensions regarding benefits of the burden, um, I always like to look going back for, okay, how are we providing good process then going forward? Um, and I like the Schopenhauer quote, that the present is inadequate, the past is irrecoverable, and the future is uncertain. So uh, we have, a, a, a say, Cassandra, a child with cancer. We can't change that. Um, we have uncertainty around the current present decisions. Um, it's not great. Um, and the future, we don't really know. Um, and so when we have something like this, it speaks to how are we providing best process going forward and able to balancing all these complexities uh, into the best possible or maybe even the least worse uh, path forward. And this involves being comfortable with being uncomfortable, um, potentially a need to accept suboptimal or non-ideal options Again, doing that moderated by good process. And how I like to think of process or the ways I, I look about how do we go forward balancing this is to really get kind of granular in this, um, but, but importantly so. And this gets into this principles of inductive risk, um, which I re really liked after I read um, Sid Johnson's book on the ethics of uncertainty, which she was talking about disorders of consciousness, but I really think it's applicable to anytime we have uncertainty um, and potential ethical risks. And so it's a way to balance uh, what are the ethical risks, so the ethically significant consequences of being wrong, and the epistemic risk, the risk of getting the wrong answer or accepting a wrong hypothesis. And the principles of inductive risk, um, which are, are a little confusing at first glance, but I'll hopefully um, elaborate on them a little bit, which is you, you want to index your epistemic risk um, taking to the ethical risks of being wrong. So you, your epistemic risks are indexed against the ethical risks of being wrong. 
and you want to index your ethical risk taking to the epistemic risks of being wrong. And so what this means is, so the ethically significant consequences of being wrong should constrain epistemic decisions about accept, accepting a hypothesis. So basically, where ethical risk is high, our epistemic standard level of certainty should be quite high. Where ethical risk is low, we might tolerate more uncertainty, more epistemic risk. And so how do we do this? Well, so we we look at this in weighing the risk of receiving or not receiving the treatment, acquiescing to or overriding the patient, uh, and threats to the therapeutic relationship or good medical practice, right? Um, what are the burdens of, of Cassandra getting the treatment or not getting the treatment? What is uh, the risk of acquiescing to her refusal or overriding her refusal? And is this good medical practice or is this a threat to the therapeutic relationship, right? Or what are those, how does that weigh out? And I should note that we think of overriding sometimes and I ask the question to the clinicians, how far are we willing to go to force the treatment, right? Are we, are we willing to, you know, I think, you know, we don't always know that, right? So saying, Cassandra, you have to live in the hospital now for five months. Um, we don't know that she's going to need to be uh, strapped down to the bed for those five months. Um, and so there's a, there's a risk in saying, or, you know, to going to right to that, right? It's so saying, well, we're not going to fold her down, so let's not override that. Um, because I think there's a little bit of nuance in there. However, if it got to that point where we were needing to strap her down, I think that should change our analysis of how much harm we're willing to go through for what benefit. Um, we just don't always know that at the time. And so I think, you know, sometimes we have to look at that as a real or potential, right? Do we actually know we're going to have to, to restrain this child? Because I don't know that many of us would then uh, think about changing where our risk uh, calculus came out there. And again, all these things go together into determining this, whether something is impermissible, permissible, or obligatory, right? And so it gets us then back into this, where, where does this exist? And for, you know, Cassandra, my own personal opinion, where the ethical permissibility of refusing is, is, you know, this is a, uh, it's advisable to do the treatment, but potentially permissible to refuse. It, the reason it's such a tricky case is because it borderlines on obligatory, right? Uh, and the reason so is that it's very difficult to say um, we did it was wrong to force her uh, because she was alive then to pursue treatment after the fact. And we can't reconcile with that, right? We, we don't know what the future holds. We could only go for, for, through the process that we had at the time. All right. And so I want to quickly and then we'll have time for questions, go through just a couple other cases that I think are a little more clear to me um, in order to illustrate some of this a little bit better. So suppose we have a 16-year-old with cystic fibrosis, so pretty significant chronic lung infection. Uh, pretend this is COVID times. Uh, they attend a large school without masking mandates, and the child doesn't mask. You advise the child that if they contract COVID, they are at significant risk of severe illness and death. Uh, for a child with cystic fibrosis, this definitely was true. Uh, and that the vaccine is safe with minimal burden. The child declines the vaccine and says they don't believe in COVID. Uh, then they, the vaccine is just for pharmaceutical companies to make money. Despite explaining that they would not be charged for the vaccine, they still decline. So how do we think about this? Well, if we go through proportionality, we see that the shot has low burden. Uh, the side effects of vaccine are arguably manageable. Um, avoiding severe disease from COVID for a child with cystic fibrosis has significant benefit in reducing likelihood of severe morbidity and death. The vaccine is clearly beneficial with very low burden. Um, it is uncertain though, if they will contract COVID and thus the benefit from the vaccine. So we, we don't know really if they will or will not. It's not a, the level of certainty is unknown whether they actually will contract it or not. Um, even though we think it might be likely given, given those risk factors, um, there is no certainty that they will avoid sig significant imminent harm from not receiving the vaccine. Meaning even if they get the vaccine, we're not certain that they won't contract the illness and still have um, significant illness from that. Uh, and the treatment effectiveness, it's, it's also uncertain that it will prevent severe illness, right? So even if they do contract it, um, at, that, at that point, we weren't quite sure that whether it would be very effective. But we were certain, that I think, that would have some benefit, but whether it would avoid severe illness altogether, I think we didn't, weren't quite sure. So the other considerations are how would we enforce administration, right? You know, for a, a, a two-year-old who doesn't want a shot, um, we we would, at most 
pediatrician offices do, we would have the parent hold them and they would get the shot because we wouldn't take their bodily autonomy and integrity into the question because of their their age and their ability to, to have that capacity to uh, make those decisions. For a teenager, their bodily integrity becomes more impactful and more weighty, right? The trauma of holding down a teenager to give them a shot could be quite detrimental. Um, and we want them to be uh, future adult patients, right? So what would this do to the therapeutic relationship? Um, that the trauma from overriding their bodily integrity carries more weight than it does, say, a two-year-old. And the benefits of the vaccine in this case are overridden uh, by the burdens of harm from overriding the child's uh, autonomy, given the minimal risk to their open future. And in this way, we'd want to have trustworthiness being the best path forward. Um, so continuing to keep that therapeutic relationship with them in order to hopefully continue to work with them and make a better decision, uh, knowing that it's uncomfortable, right? Because we do know that this is an effective vaccine that could really benefit them. But we're just saying at this point, uh, holding them down and giving them a shot might be more harmful, uh, not only to uh, current trauma, uh, but also long-term trustworthiness. So other examples of things like this are, you know, what I get questions about is treatments such as nebulizers in acute care settings. So teenagers in an ICU needs a nebulizer uh, and they're refusing. And this is where we kind of get into, you know, is this one nebulizer this one time going to greatly affect their overall uh, survival? Um, how certain are we? Uh, are we so certain it's so necessary that we would uh, restrain them and forcibly give them to them? Um, those kind of considerations come through well. Uh, in addition, you know, refusal of anticoagulant in, in the presence of history of clotting disorder. And then a case example of demand. So suppose you have a 15 year old with a history of dysmenorrhea. Um, they come to the clinic requesting a hysterectomy and oophorectomy. They have not attempted medical treatment. Uh, states they know they do not want children anyways. They don't want to take pills. And they just want their uterus out and say the parent is supportive. So a pretty unlikely uh, scenario, um, but mostly using this for the purpose of uh, the thought experiment here. And so we have to consider these demands in the same way. How much harm from waiting versus doing now? What the epistemic risk in that we don't know the future, uh, ethical risk in both waiting and doing now, right? So um, there's an ethical risk of, so we don't really know that she doesn't want kids in the future. We know that currently she doesn't want kids uh, and she doesn't want to take pills. But we have an ethical risk, right? We have an ethical risk of um, if she doesn't want to take pills, she still is going to have some harm then from dysmenorrhea. Uh, but we also have an ethical risk of, of um, doing it now, meaning that later on, we can't put the uterus back in. And so how do we provide fair process, right? Well, we want to balance beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and consideration of current and future self. Uh, and in this situation, we would say, well, the process would be um, you haven't tried uh, oral contraceptive. We haven't tried all these different measures in going forward with that. Um, and so we would want to protect their open future in that way. You know, other examples of this are body augmentation without medical indications, such as tattoos or cosmetic plastic surgery. Uh, those are things if you ask the ethicist would say, well, if there's no medical indication, uh, then those things should, should not be undertaken, even if they're demanding them. Um, and you know there could be a, a medical indication for say this dysmenorrhea and hysterectomy, except that they haven't undergone all these sort of minimally invasive processes of medical management prior to that indication. And so when would we honor demands or requests, right? And so there are some appearance altering procedures, maybe when it causes significant anxiety, it's questionable or burden. Um, or things like nevus removal or port wine center removal, these things are questionably low burden. You know, there's low ethical risk that, um, you know, a child might grow up and say, I really wish you hadn't taken off that port wine stain removal. Um, there's a little bit of argument here that you could make, right? That there is some risk, especially if they're doing it in the OR or something like that those, those have some risk to it that's not zero. Um, but there's low ethical risk long term in that they might not want these, right? Or if you have significant anxiety related to uh, something, one could then start to make an argument that uh, there is significant burden right now 
uh, that uh, could make it indicated. Um, breast reduction, maybe if there's some medical indication, um, I, I could foresee that potentially um, um, being reasonable in some very small cases. Um, again, there's some medical indication there, right? And so these are things where there, you have to look for a defined medical benefit and a low risk to the open future. So where the current risks or burdens are higher or equal to the risk to your open future. And discordance also comes up a lot in here. And I, I saw some questions come through this um, preliminarily. So I wanted to speak to this a little bit. So whether there's parent adolescent disagreement, maybe there's an adolescent who's poorly managing their chronic condition. So, you know, a 17 year old who's poorly managing their diabetes um, or they're not taking their medications that as prescribed. Um, or there's a cultural discordance with the medical team, say uh, parents don't want to tell the patient um, that what their, their diagnosis is. Um, and these things are all uh, come up, you know, um, again, in the same analysis of treatment effectiveness, uncertainty, and proportionality uh, in this. And with a parent-adolescent disagreement, we would also uh, consider that in the context of um, Depends. It depends a lot on the situation, um, and same with uh, adolescent poorly managing their chronic condition. Um, we are very limited in, in what we can sort of physically enforce a child to do from day to day. And while they might be poorly managing their chronic condition, even though we could maybe force them to manage it better, uh, would we then be ruining our trustworthiness to hopefully become a a, a well managed um, adult patient? Um, and cultural discordance with the medical team really comes up against a couple of different things that are a little bit um, unique that I haven't talked about, which is our sense of obligation to um, not lie, um, but also recognizing it within a cultural system that might have a different set of, of values. And these are going to really be case by case uh, um, situations in which where we also want to provide good process, right? So for all three of these good process is still important, right? What is the parent adolescent disagreement? What do we know about the disagreement? What is the parent's views? What are the adolescent's views? What is the proportionality of the treatment in question? What is the treatment effectiveness? Um, all of those different things will play into maybe how we then navigate that going forward. Um, you know, in uh, Cassandra's case, there wasn't disagreement between the parent and the adolescent. Um, and if there was, and the parent wanted her, we may have put more weights on forcing her uh, in that situation um, than not. Um, and maybe it wouldn't have been as contentious of a case, um, or, or at least for the people who responded that we should have allowed her to, to dissent. Um, for an adolescent poorly managing chronic condition, the same good process needs to go through, right? What is the risks of them poorly managing? What is the risk to them uh, of, of overriding their management and the same thing with the discord. And so um, the angst and analyst and decision-making really gets into the considerations of how we balance benefits and burdens of treatment, current and future uncertainty, protecting them from their potentially bad decisions, but also at the same time, respecting their control over their bodies. And so dealing with this angst sometimes requires us to be comfortable with the non-ideal care plan for the greater good of improved trust long-term um, but also it requires us being comfortable with being uncomfortable uh, and really looking at how do we let go of our angst by providing that good process going forward. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Ian. This was such a fascinating and really thorough presentation on adolescent decision making. We've got some great questions in our Q&A. Feel free to continue posting in the Q&A um, to any audience members who still have questions. But I'm going to start with a question that was asked early on um, from Karen, which says, how important is the adolescent's experience with their illness to the ter determination that we make. It seems like teens who have been living with their illness for a long time may be better positioned to make the decision um, than the care team. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. And there's been some debate about this even down to ages of five. I know there was a, a case that was in CNN quite some years ago where uh, Art Kaplan and Chris Butner, um disagreed about the five-year-old's ability to sort of make these decisions. And I think um, it, it depends, right? Um, it, it certainly, if it was something with, and if this was a progressive 
neurologic disorder that she was certainly going to, to die from. And so that might be different than, say, something that's more treatable, right? It's really complicated. But for a child living with a chronic condition, I, I think that becomes more important about their life experience. Again, we can't look to the, the, the child's current self to give us a sense of their future self. But when they have a child with a chronic condition or something more significant, we should look more to them because they're the ones living with their body, right? And as they age, we want to give them more rights over their body and more respect for their bodily integrity. And so this has come up a little bit with as as you know, our, our child mortality has significantly dropped after the 19th century, right? But our but our our chronic conditions have significantly increased. And so it really begs the question of looking at what are those lived experiences because as they become more uh, medically complex, they should have more of a say in those because it's a little more gray on, um, it's, it becomes a little more value laden, right? And I think when you have somebody with a uh, potentially limiting life expectancy, then you want to really incorporate more of their experiences in, into the moral calculus. Right. Absolutely. It reminds me sort of of how you weigh with certainty of the of the prognosis, right? And certainty of the effectiveness of the treatment as well, right? So if a ad adolescent has already been through a treatment and they have to go through it again, right? Their experience actually does make a difference in speaking to if they want to say, do something again, or, you know, continue on with this into adulthood, if they've already been. Yeah, so so in one example, we, we generally wouldn't let, say, someone coming in, say, a 15-year-old who's uh, as a broken femur and they have blood loss and they're in hemorrhagic shock and it's, say they say they're Jehovah's Witness and they want to refuse blood products. We generally in that sense wouldn't say that, but say you have a similar child with a relapsed oncologic diagnosis with a potentially grim prognosis who is seeking, you know, more, more comfort directed care, then we would honor some of those considerations spiritually based on that, right? And, and you can make the harm situation. There's plenty of, uh, plenty, there's some cases where kids have not been able to refuse something and later go on to say, I really wish I had been. And that really harmed me later on. And, and we have to, that, that's a big harm. Mm -hmm. um, how do you reconcile that they're alive to say that is, is another question. So talking about the sort of harm category of when we decide or when we come to, you know, determine that treatments are obligatory, that this is not something that adolescents can refuse. Megan asked this question, what is the obligation to make a concerted effort to get an adolescent patient on board with treatment before forcing? And then my follow-up is, what do we do when we are, you know, forcing treatment upon an adolescent? Yeah, I think it's a really important question for two reasons. One is, I think we need to consider what harm they're going to go through to get that, right? But it doesn't always mean you know, because sometimes I ask that question, you know, what, what are we willing to put this child through to, to force this treatment? It doesn't always mean they will need enforcement, right? So I think we need to, I think we, we always want to err on least restrictive means and understand that sometimes we're going to have to, we, we can, we, well, first we want to always try to get them on board, right? Because that's just going to be better for their long-term outcome, right? Getting to the, the reasons why we want it, the benefits of including children in their decisions are to build up those decision-making skills. And so, good process should always be made uh, in, in any situation like that to bring them on board. Uh, and then I think you get into the, you're more restrictive of saying, no, you're going to have to take this. Um, we don't know if they're going to need to be held down or something like that. And, and that might make it too harmful, but we don't know that. So if we get to that point, then we can say, you know what, this is too harmful uh, because the significant trauma, I suppose, of saying like required restraints for X number of days are just too harmful, even if the alternative is, you know, not getting the treatment. And that's, that's really, I think that, that's such an important point because often we can think, oh, we shouldn't, we should know now if we're willing to accept, you know, something like restraints or sedation for this child. But as you say, because the future is uncertain, we don't know how adolescent patients are going to respond. We, that also has to sort of be an open question and we have to take it, you know, as this particular individual, you know, navigates this case and navigates their care. Right, so many fantastic questions. And you know, every case is gonna be so different because every child is gonna be so different. Their level of maturity within each situation, with each diagnosis, you know, it's, it's gonna be so individualized. 
Absolutely. Um, I, I want to pivot a little bit to talking about the parental role. Um, what would you, this is a question from Megan, what would you recommend in situations where a parent does not want to disclose a diagnosis and or the purpose of a medication or treatment plan to an adolescent? Yeah. I mean, the first thing I want to do is always, and I know I, I've glossed over a lot of the parents in this because I was talking mostly about the adolescents, but I, I would always go to the parents to understand who the adolescent is as well, as well as talking to the adolescent, right? Um, and then I'd want to understand what the parent is hoping for. Um, I mean, I think we generally, uh, most of us would say that adolescents will figure it out. And so what are we trying to accomplish by this? Um, how is that balanced against the clinicians then potential to have to lie to a patient? Um, and so there's a lot of different complexities in there. And so, I mean, I think, you know, if there was some maybe cultural consideration that the child was certainly a part of this rich culture, that, you know, that was a part of their thing, that would be more easy to accept than say, I'm just worried that, you know, X, Y, and Z will happen. Like, she'll understand how serious this is. And it's like, well, okay, let's explore that more because she probably already understands how serious this, this is. Mm -hmm. um, so and like it'll probably slip out. So we need to have these conversations. Right. That request for non-disclosure, I think, is such a great opportunity to explore, right, to engage in really thorough exploration of reasoning and intent and background. I absolutely agree. Uh, I'm going to keep moving on. So many fantastic questions. Alice asks, how do we determine the degree of burden of a treatment to an adolescent? It seems difficult to balance trusting their experience of how much a treatment would burden them while also having broader experience of burdens in general or understanding what they might be able to endure when a treatment has a high degree of effectiveness. This to me talks a little bit about your request that we become uncomfortable with our angst, but I'd like to hear how you, <laughs> you respond to this question. I agree. I mean, because there's there's not a lot of, like a lot of times we have to accept sort of non-ideal or, or sort of, you know, not great feeling plans. Um, I mean, that's, that's going to be different for, for each case. I mean, I, I think we always want to explore the, the adolescent's experience. I don't think that in every case that will win out, nor do I think that in every case, you know, our, our sense of the burdens will weigh out, right? It's, it's, it's sort of this really delicate balance uh, and there's no calculus for it, right? I think this is where a good process comes in. Um, do the clinicians agree? Do the parents agree? And sometimes, unfortunately, they go to the, the courts and the courts have to weigh in as they did in Cassandra's case, rightly or wrongly. I'm not sure how I feel about that either, um, to be to be honest. Um, and you can see there was pretty significant changes as we went on. Um, you know, I, I think, and then you get into this question of, but they're alive to disagree with you later on. And that's really hard. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sort of skating around her question, but to, to essentially say, um, I mean, I, I think it's easier the more closely it becomes effective and with higher degree of certainty and life uh, when it comes into life or death, you know, it becomes a little bit more difficult where, you know, for Cassandra's case, I mean, she could go through all this and, and still die. And in six months, she could just refuse. So what do you do with that? Um, and I think why that's why that case is such a good one in displaying like how much angst there is, because it's not, I don't think it's really clear um, what the right thing was. Mm -hmm. Although I think as, as many of the, the participants here changed into more uh, supporting her right to refuse. So for our last question, Carolyn asks, should the courts be involved in these decision-making processes at all? <laughs> um, and I know you've seen a lot of court involvement. So talk just so briefly about the harms and the benefits of court involvement. Well, I mean, I, I think that those are good questions. And I don't know that I have a, a good answer for that. I think there's arguments to say the courts shouldn't be involved. Um, but sometimes I think there is so much uncertainty around these cases that somebody has to weigh in and make a decision. Um, and because I, I always say, you know, because we always look at the harms of reporting to the county or to the state for these things. But I like to say that's just our obligation. We don't make the decision in that, right? That's the county and the court. And so I think you have to have somebody that comes in finally and just says, this is what we're doing, right or wrong. And as most, most people have seen, the courts are, are pretty um, eclectic on how they might decide those things. Um, so I don't know, some countries have ascent and capacity boards where this is not an issue because they don't have the magic line of 18, but uh, until we get rid of that magic line of 18, I, I think um, right or wrong, the courts will have to get involved and sometimes unnecessarily and, and sometimes uh, necessarily maybe if we don't, we don't believe and know what the right thing to do is. 
Thank you so much, Ian, for your sharing your expertise with us and kind of exploring the complexities of adolescent decision making, leaving us all feeling perhaps more uncertain, um, or maybe perhaps a little bit more comfortable with the fact that we are uncertain. Um, I just want to make a note that um, Dr. Ian Wolf is presenting on gender, gender pediatric decision making in gender care. <laughs> And so that is going to be our April session of Ethics Grand Rounds. If you are specifically interested in that topic, I would really recommend registering for that session. That is a topic that warrants a significant amount of exploration and discussion. So we did not discuss that today because of that. So please look at that session, look to attend that session. We have other events coming up from the Center of, uh, for Bioethics that we would appreciate you attending. Uh, and if you are a U of M student looking to get IPE credit, please follow the for the details in the presentation document to, to join the Zoom session that we're going to have. Thank you all so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next time.